So everything about it looks and feels, depending on the court that you're in and how rehabilitative and how trauma-informed it is, right? But everything looks and feels like a criminal court, but legally it's not a criminal court, which means that the terminology is different. So instead of being convicted, you can't be convicted in a delinquency court of a crime. You are adjudicated and then you are, um, people determine what your treatment plan is. So it's not like you're given a sentence six months in a placement. That's not how that works. It is, we have determined that you need to comply with these things in order to complete a treatment plan. And that means that the court has a lot of discretion. The court, the probation officers have a ton of discretion over how long and to what extent a child gets engaged in the system. Um, that's especially important for girls because when girls come into the system, there's no clear sense of how and when they're gonna get out, right? And the reason that that's important is because girls are coming into the system for acts that are not violent and that for a lot, a lot of times really shouldn't be dealt with in the delinquency court. So last year in 2015, around this time, our organization partnered with the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality and the Miss Foundation to publish a report called the Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline. And the reason that we did this was because there really was no narrative about what was driving girls into the system, right? So people were saying, hey, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, but what is it? And what we found was that overwhelmingly, the experience of childhood sexual abuse is a major, it's one of the primary predictors for engagement in the juvenile justice system. So what does that mean? What that means is that when girls, particularly marginalized girls, girls that fall at the intersections of race, gender, poverty, system involvement, come from communities that have extensive system involvement, experience sexual abuse, they are criminalized and pushed into the delinquency system as opposed to being given the resources that they need to heal. So um, the other thing that I will mention about girls' involvement is that um, more and more we are seeing, and there's a great report um, called Gender Injustice that I would encourage you guys to read. It's by Professor Fran Sherman and Annie Balk. Um, and basically, a lot of what that talks about is a lot of the trends that we were talking about. It provides a lot of data, but it also specifically mentions the role of mandatory domestic violence laws in increasing involvement for girls in the juvenile justice system. So during the sort of movement to combat domestic violence, there were a bunch of laws that were passed basically saying that if, if the police responded to a domestic violence call, someone had to be arrested. And the reason for those laws was because victims were not willing to come forward in those instances and report that their abusers should be arrested. So they put into place these mandatory arrest laws, which theoretically were for the benefit of the victim. In a lot of ways, they have really helped to um, deter and also address domestic violence, right? The problem is that what has happened is that we've seen these laws be applied to family conflict situations. So more and more the other offense that's bringing girls into the system are simple assault type offenses that are directly linked to family conflict. So if I'm a police officer that responds to a situation where a child is fighting with her mother, right? Um, I have to, it's a domestic violence call. I as the officer may feel like I need to arrest someone. There are five other kids in the house. Am I gonna arrest the parent and, and potentially refer five other children to the child welfare system? Or I, am I gonna arrest that one child, charge her with simple assault, put her in the delinquency system? So that's another way that girls are being funneled into the juvenile justice system. Um, what we know about girls in the juvenile justice system, I mentioned high rates of sexual violence, so I have a slide later that talks about some of these rates. The most recent number that we have is a study out of South Carolina in 2009. 81% of girls in their juvenile justice system reported experiencing sexual violence. Why do you think I've placed an emphasis on reported? Go ahead. A lot of that goes unreported. Right. Sexual violence is an underreported, grossly underreported crime because we don't have language around it. We don't know how to talk to people. We don't know how to interview people. Um, we haven't set up systems that make it safe for people to come forward and disclose that they're experiencing sexual violence. And then the nature of sexual violence is a shaming and a stigmatizing one. So naturally, a survivor is not going to want to come forward um, and talk about it. So. Um, if 81% are reporting sexual violence, we know that that number is higher, right? 
And they're not reporting sexual violence after system contact. They're reporting childhood sexual abuse, right? Um, other numbers are similarly high. It's anywhere from 73 to, to like I said, 81%. When you talk and you incorporate physical violence in there, that number goes up to like 93%, right? Um, so we're talking about children who are severely traumatized and severely abused, but for whom that abuse has gone unrecognized and unaddressed. As a consequence, we know that girls in the system have exceptionally high rates of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. We also know that they experience a disproportionate range of adverse childhood experiences. Does anyone know what an adverse childhood experience is? It's some sort of trauma, like physical or sexual abuse. It could be a, like a parent in the, ju in, in the justice system. It could be a divorce, something, a death. Right, so basically there was a study that a bunch of um, uh, brilliant people did a while ago that basically tracked how experiencing certain factors would impact your health, physical health outcomes um, into adulthood. So there are things like experiencing poverty, having an incarcerated household member, witnessing domestic violence in your household, experiencing certain kinds of abuse yourself, and they found that it, it negatively impacted your actual physical health in your adult life, right? So they did that for justice-involved youth, and they found that for girls, girls were a lot more likely to report a number, five or more ACEs, right? So um, these are some of the um, ACEs that they, they look at. So vi witnessing violent treatment towards a mother, household substance abuse. Violent treatment towards a mother is a particular ACE. So I point that out to talk again about how this is gendered. If you are a girl or a female identifying youth who grows up in a household and witnesses violence towards the other person of your gender in that household, that's going to impact your ability to navigate in the world, right? On top of the fact that it's gonna have all of these emotional, mental health, and physical health outcomes. So what we found was girls are nearly two times as likely as boys to report five or more of these factors, right? So when I talk about, or when I asked you that question about at intake, at the point of arrest, what is a girl carrying with her? It's all of this, right? Um, and then, as I mentioned, obviously the rates of sexual abuse are more than four times higher for girls. Again, we don't know about the numbers for girls. We certainly don't know about the numbers for boys, but this is the data that we have, is that girls are experiencing sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse, at much higher rates than boys when they're coming into the system. Um, so in terms of what it means to have a high A score, it means that you're probably gonna have more behavioral problems, right? You're coming with a lot more instability and trauma. It means that you're more likely to attempt suicide, right? Um, it means that you are 980% more likely, if you have seven or more ACEs, to have significant mental health outcomes. Really quickly, I wanna point out, um, there was a study that was done um, with girls in detention centers in Philly. Just of within seven days of your arrest and intake, what was going on in your head? What was going on in your life? 28% had, had had a history of self-harm, we're reporting that. 22% had experienced sexual assault within seven days of getting arrested, right? So it's not like the trauma happened 10 years ago, it's like the trauma happened yesterday. And when we're talking about girls who are being arrested for prostitution, the trauma probably happened 30 minutes before the arrest, right? Um, we'll talk about sexual exploitation in one second, but um, federal law says that if you are under the age of 18, um, it doesn't matter whether someone paid you, whether you had a pimp, if there is an adult who exchanged in a sexual act with you for anything of value, it does not have to be money, you are a victim of human trafficking. That's what the federal law says. State law doesn't necessarily align. Age of consent laws get in the way, which we'll talk about in a second. But the fact of the matter is technically you're defined as a victim, right? Because we have recognized that children should never be responsible for acts of abuse done to them by adults, right? Um, for adults engaging in, at the very least, statutory rape. But we know that when we're talking about sexually exploited youth, there are huge amounts of coercion that are present, right? If not actual, like straight out physical force um, that is placing them in that situation. Um, and yet we arrest them for prostitution, right? So if you imagine a girl who is being forced or 
through circumstances of her life is feeling like her only option to survive is to engage in a sexual act with an adult who is paying to engage um, in an act of child abuse, basically, um, then we arrest her like an hour after that happens, right? That's the trauma that she's coming with. She was literally abused like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, um, an hour before she was arrested, right? Um, head injury within the last seven days, 13% of them are reporting that, right? So it's not just sexual violence, it's not just emotional trauma, there's also physical violence that girls are experiencing when they come into the system. Um, let's see. So what we know is that, as I mentioned, nationally 73% of girls in the system have experienced some kind of abuse. So when we talk about the abuse to prison pipeline, it's very clear. When girls, particularly certain girls, are abused, our response is to criminalize, right? What does that mean? So we lay out three different ways. One is the arrest and detention of status offenders. What's a status offense? Go ahead. Uh, crime that wouldn't Right, because if you are an adult and you run away, I can't be charged, right? If I'm a child and I run away from home, I can be charged, right? Um, why can status offenders be detained legally? Does anybody know this? The VCO. What's the VCO? The, oof, I forgot what it actually stands for, but a judge can basically say, um, without issuing an actual order, like, you need to start showing up to school. If you don't, then you can be detained for refusing to follow a judge's order, whether it be an, a legitimate order or just something a judge said to you to do. Right, so basically the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act says states cannot receive federal funding if they detain status offenders, right, in large amounts. Um, that's one of the core requirements, right, of the JJDPA. Um, in the 80s there was an amendment that was put in that basically said that if you Viol so you can't be arrested. If I get arrested for running away, they can't detain me on that first appearance, right? But if the judge issues an order, what's called a valid court order, and all it needs to be to be a valid court order is that a judge told you so, right? If the judge says stop running away and then I violate that, I can be detained, right? If a girl is running away because she's in an unsafe situation or in a physically or sexually abusive environment at home, right? And I show up to court, and in court is my mother. Maybe her boyfriend who's abusing me is also in court as the primary caregiver in the house, right? Am I gonna tell the judge why I'm running away? Probably not, right? And so if the judge says, well, stop running away, I'm not gonna stop running away. So inevitably, I am going to end up back in court. I am going to be detained. But think about why we are incarcerating that child, right? We are incarcerating her because she's running from a situation that she does not feel is safe, or she's running because that's a learned trauma response, that she's grown up in traumatic environments. This is especially true for children in the foster care system, right? Running is a coping strategy. That's what you know to do. Even if it is a safe environment, I maybe haven't learned the skills to be able to determine whether it's safe. And so as soon as I feel uncomfortable, I may run. And if we don't address that root cause, inevitably I end up incarcerated, right? The second, way that the sexual abuse to prison pipeline operates is through crossover, right? Um, so a girl gets removed from her home by the child welfare system because of sexual abuse in the home. And then this goes back to the example that I mentioned at the front. Child welfare system says, I can't keep her safe. She keeps running away. I think she would be better suited in a more secure facility. We're going to transfer her to, we're going to petition the court and the court is going to um, determine that now she's in the care of the delinquency system which from a legal perspective, maybe not a big deal, right? That's the difference between one code and another code, you're still in the family court. For that child, I just went from being placed in a system that is theoretically to treat abused and neglected children to a system that is designed, one, to rehabilitate, but also to calculate and factor in public safety, right? So now when they determine what to do with me, they're also thinking about, am I a danger to the public? Um, and they can place me in secure facilities, right? Secure facilities being detention centers or locked placements in ways that they cannot usually in the child welfare system unless it's like a high level mental health facility. Um, 
And then finally, we get to domestic child sex trafficking. So as I mentioned, domestic child sex trafficking um, refers specifically to American-born children who are being trafficked, right? When I say trafficked, 